What it is, everybody. I'm doing a different kind of show today. Oh, I haven't even tweeted it out yet. I'm going to have guests joining me. This is going to be a hangout. I'm doing it. In oh, no. Hold on, everybody. Hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm playing on my other channel. Um, it's a Google Hangout, so you don't have my intro or anything else. I already have The Last American Vagabond on with me. I just wanted to go over one thing before we get started, and let me talk about the how this show is going to be regulated on a bunch of different people. I expect, since it's the first show, that we might not get a bunch, um, but I hope to max out at three guests at a time. That's my. That's what I'm going to try to do for the sake of entertainment. And then I am going to try to regulate the show as well as possible so that um, people know, you know, what to say, when to say it and all that. And we can try to keep it as entertaining as possible. We'll see. Um, but I'm, I'll try to host the show as well as I can. Um, let me see who's in the, let me make sure I have the chat pulled up because people might join in the chat. We hopefully will have some big names join us. So what I was going to say, if you guys haven't seen this yesterday, oh, what we're going to talk about. The theme of this show, because we're trying to unite, truthers unite, right? So we're trying to do that more. I've uh, appeared with Titus and, uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Sorry, I've had it muted. My name is Ryan Christian. Ryan. Okay, Ryan. Ryan. I remember. That's Ryan, the last American vagabond. Uh, I'm your host, Nathan Stoltman uh, of the channel Lift the Veil. We're going to talk about some interesting things. We're, we're, well, we're trying to get people together, first of all, and that's what we're trying to do here. There will be no fighting allowed. There won't be any shill calling allowed. We have people here who might have a tendency to do that. We have people maybe joining us who might have a tendency to do that. We're going to suspend disbelief um, during this show as much as possible and, and put to the side any issues that we might disagree on or think are shill issues. Um, for example, the flat earth or the Mandela effect or any of those things that people think makes somebody a shill. We're going to suspend disbelief on that. We might invite people on who we really think already are some kind of shill, but we still are interested in hearing from them in the, um, the uh, following that idea of suspending disbelief and taking everything kind of at face value and judging for ourselves and letting you guys decide as well. And what we're going to discuss from our various viewpoints are um, what we think the biggest problems are facing us, whether that be truthers, whether that be the planet at large um, and the general public or whatever it might be, smart cities or um, 5G. You know, we're going to talk about whatever each person thinks is the thing, and then we'll just talk about all the different challenges we face. And, um, and then from there, once we've identified what, what these possible issues are, then we talk about how we might go about solving them. Um, so that's going to be the show. I'm planning to max out. I think I said this. I want to max out at three guests at a time just to keep it digestible. And then people can rotate in and out. For example, Ryan says he's available for a certain amount of time. So I told him he can drop out whenever he wants. And if we get so many people tuned into the show, so many different channels and people who want to join, then uh, we will... Um, then we, then we might be rotating people in and out, you know, for fun. So let me see what I wanted to show you guys. I made a video yesterday. So this is one, one of the problems is YouTube. And we'll talk about that problem certainly today and how our views can be suppressed, how traffic can be manipulated, et cetera, et cetera. When I was on, um, when I was on with Ryan, I, uh, and Titus, I was saying that in my experience right now, my traffic's not being nearly as badly. Like I'm getting views. I think I just went over 4,500 subscribers, which is crazy, uh, you know, from where I was a month ago. Um, so things are going okay and they have been, but then I put out a video called Trump makes Israel great again. Let me see if I can share my screen. 
it's not going to be real um, exciting to look at. Probably, oops, not that one. Oh, do I have the option here? Wonder if I have the option to share share. Oh, it looks like you don't have the option to share screen when you're doing a hangout. Okay. You, well, you, I believe it's on your the green. Oh, there it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's in a different place. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So this is what I'm looking at now. Okay, and people can see. I'll present to everyone. Um, so this is what happened. I, if you guys can read this, you can see that if, when I do my live show or when I do the live video, it spikes. And then afterwards, it goes down pretty quickly, but then should level off, as you can kind of see here. Then in the middle of the night, traffic drops down. Anyway, I did this Israel thing. And I had a spike from another video, but then all, you can see all my traffic is down. But look at this in particular, this uh, traffic for this Israel video, um, which was talking about Zionism and stuff. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> see that? That's Yeah, that's pretty blatant. I mean, it, <laughs> it's you, you can see that. I mean, this happens with any main topic, like anything that the, we can recognize Every, across the board, actually, on either side of the fake two-party system, you know, you we can people you talk about certain things and it gets shut down. Sorry, I have a leaf blower outside. <laughs> we we just had the same thing with the video we just did with you and I, and it was, you know, it's it's obviously on a smaller scale. I don't have as many subscribers on YouTube, but it's. I just, I see it every single time with view counts, like where it just gets frozen up and, you know, where it's, it, and it's not like you, you actually the one that showed me about the real time versus, versus, you know, the, the, what it's showing you, but I can, I can actually see it ch sit there, even though we're getting likes and comments and it just doesn't change. And, you know, I think, I think that's to intentionally keep it there. So people think that it's not getting viewed. So, you know, the kind of group think people tend to avoid things they don't think are being looked at, you know? Yeah. Well, that's it. And I'll show this thing again is that um is that th in some cases from what i understand from from kind of some insider information is it'll look like this and titus um kind of um uh, uh said something about this too is that it ah, damn i only get leaf blowers on thursdays they're usually earlier that's really loud huh oh, no that worries. it might show this number of views but it uh, actually is ranking and getting way more views. That can happen. I've had a video that stopped counting. Basically, it, it does like, man, it does like a stair step down and then gets down to where it's just nothing, basically, like no traffic. Uh, but this video that said it had 30,000 views apparently had over half a million views. Um, it's just that then when people click on it, it doesn't register, their like doesn't register and maybe their comment doesn't register. Um, but Israel is out. <laughs> I was going to make a video called Israel censors YouTube. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. So I guess that that brings us to the first maybe problem, which is, um, YouTube. So if this is going to consistently be a problem, if this thing however it works basically doesn't allow us to get subscribers also however it works because if you get more views and it doesn't show the views it also doesn't allow the subscribers to join what is uh what are our solutions what do we what do we do about that to either to get the word out or or to change completely I think combination of, I mean, I, we definitely need to be looking to new platforms. And I think we've all talked about that a few times, whether it's BitChute or uh, that's the, that's the one I use. That's why I always bring it up. But I don't, I'm sure that there's plenty more that are, are reasonable, but it's just so hard to jump over there without the following. You know, I, I actually think that the, the biggest, the way that they manipulate it is by keeping it from being seen on searches until the, the fervor goes away. You know what I mean? Like, like your video shot up and then they make sure it's not anywhere. So then it goes away. And then once it's back, it doesn't really make any difference. You know, so, right. I mean, what we need to do is an official boycott on Google, you know, like all the way around. Cause I think a lot of people are beginning to change search engines. That was kind of that first step, you know, cause we're, we know that they're basically watching everything you do, but it's, it's about the, the views. And I really just think it takes that. It takes that movement. I think we need a big enough event for people to openly recognize that YouTube itself is, is not this, bastion of freedom and free speech that they pretend to be, you know, and then we, right. just, then, we then we're here to scream and say, go to BitChute, you know, or wherever else.
Okay, so I'm going to ask you then. I'm also going to make a proposal about a different um, main-based service. I think that's what BitChute is. It allows for a decentralized platform for hosting videos, right? Which is the biggest problem with hosting a video site. And vid.me, um, as, as far as what our other alternatives are, vid.me just shut down, right? Did you hear that news? Yeah, yeah, I think we talked about that live when it just happened. Or I got that Vimeo. Email. No, that was that was vid.me and it it, I, it was a weird email. It basically said that they weren't I think it was a funding issue. I, it, it, we, the email sent out to anybody who had an account and just said that we're temp, you know, we're shutting down, but he did say they're going toward they're going to be doing something else. So right. It's not gone right. for good, but that platform I guess is shut down, so it's, that's kind yeah. of frustrating. Yeah, so that's one of the other alternatives and then I guess the other one is Vimeo. I never really played around on there too much. One of them came out with a lot. Uh, I mean, one of the, th okay, so uh, one thing at a time. So it shut down. It said it could make money, basically, and that the issue of hosting all these videos is an insane thing to do and costs a shitload of money. But believe it or not, YouTube may be losing money. <laughs> you know it just to to do it um because of how expensive it is to um have the servers and have it scalable and be able to upload all of the content that goes onto these servers and that's why you only see really big players kind of involved in it you know facebook twitter youtube um and as far as live video which is the next thing well let me i'm I, i'm getting ahead of myself because i'll talk about live video um but one of the things that was curious in that vid.me email is they mentioned the blockchain and they mentioned that that might be a solution and there are a few platforms out there so there's BitChute, and what that does from what i understand and maybe you could tell me is it allows videos to be hosted it's a decentralized hosting platform so the videos are basically hosted it's kind of like a peer, it's peer-to-peer -peer, right it's kind of like napster was right yeah, th that's, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on it. I only know kind of just the surface level info. I, I actually was introduced to it by James Corbett, but it's, that is absolutely correct. And the idea is to, is, I th and I actually think that that's the, what we could make as the argument for all the things we'll talk about today is some, in a decentralized aspect, using this blockchain technology in some way or another to completely take it out of the hands of, of these governmental entities, you know, and I, it's anything, anything peer to peer, I think right. is the solution. And I, I do, I think that's what's happening, but it's, it's it's not as easy to use either. There's issues with sharing and you know embedding videos because that's one of the issues I have is I, I embed a lot and that, it actually frustrates me because I've been using YouTube for so long that if, if and when I make this complete shift, I have to go back through hundreds of thousands of articles and change all these embedded videos that are on YouTube right now. Right. You know, and BitChute's harder to do that with, which I'm sure they're trying to find solutions for. But I know that this was a guy who started this because James Corbett had been calling for it for so long and he was one of James Corbett's followers and just said, I'm gonna do it and just stepped up and made BitChute. And so I know that it's not this, you know, big entity with all the unlimited funds like some of these things would be, you know? Right, right. I find it interesting that you say that YouTube's probably losing money. I, I would argue that that's probably the case, but we know that none of these things are about making money for them, it's about control. So that's what, you know, so this guy for BitChute is probably really hard to compete with that because he's just probably one guy with a team trying to trying to pick it up, you know? Yeah, well, however it works. So I was going to ask you how it's going for you. I, I assume you're, are you getting much traction there? Because I have, everything of mine is uploaded now to BitChute. Um, and I just don't get very many views. It might be like 50 or something um, per video, but it doesn't seem to be growing at all. Um, are you getting any traction with yeah, that? Yeah, it's interesting that that's the exact same almost exactly like 49, 50 something on just about every video, except for a few that got a hundred over a few hundred, but it's, I'm, I'm the same way. And I would, I, I bet you it's just because it's a limited audience and the people that are on there are probably diehard about it. And so they're trying to watch up everything they can and support everything. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's the issue is just less people. And now BitChute, can you make money off of BitChute the way you can off Steemit or DTube? You know, I'm not sure exactly. I would imagine there's probably sure. something there. I don't want to, uh, you know, speak f without knowing, but uh, okay. I know that that's probably where a lot of these decentralized blockchain type of things are going toward, right? So then you have can... You, um, have you... Okay, so there's another platform out there, a decentralized platform but based on the blockchain, and it's it's affiliated with Steemit. I guess it's Steemit's video platform. It's DTube. 
I think it's dtube.video or d.tube. And um, I'll show people what BitChute looks like so they can see. So we're talking about potential solutions to the YouTube problem. Um, BitChute is one of them. Um, like Ryan said, um, like Ryan said, James Corbett on there and was and basically, I guess, came up with the idea in a certain sense. And then there are certain people who are taking advantage of the platform. And well, I don't know about taking advantage of the platform, but getting in there early. And Molyneux, you can see right here, um, like uh, Tim uh, Poole, like you can see right here, they're showing up on the first page. The only thing is, is Tim posted this video one, two minutes ago. It's got one view. Steph Melanie's posted this video 28 minutes ago. It's got 23 views. I don't know. I, like I said, I'm on here um, I, because I think if these things do take off early, um, because then you can get a foothold and, and you know, you're going to get ranked based on how many people watch. And if you get a number of followers and they watch automatically, then you're going to rank near the top when other people are just coming over to the platform. So I, th so I think it's worth the investment, um, even if it's not, if it doesn't seem like it's paying off at all. Um, because I think this stuff will, I think this blockchain based peer to peer stuff will take off. And just to show you guys how it looks on there, um, this one, you can see it's in the popular tab right now. They have a trending tab also. Um, we'll see how the videos play. It's a little different than YouTube, but so it plays right away. Um, you can see it's coming off of four peers right now. Um, similar to Napster, if people remember Napster, um, I'm, I, from what I recall of Napster, you know, you have a certain number of peers hosting it and you're able to pull it in. Um, Tim has 233 subscribers. Let's see if I, uh, oh yeah, cool. Let's see what I'm doing on there. Uh, yeah, it's interesting though, because you would see these videos for both of them, see if Stefan or, or Tim would get, would probably be, you know, 50 times higher than that on YouTube, you know? So oh, it's like, absolutely. But, but I definitely agree that we need to get over to these regardless. You know, that that's just the first step. Like even if we're getting 50 views, continue right. to funnel people over there. And I actually try to use BitChute when I share things as much as possible. Man, I'm, I don't know why I'm having trouble with your connection. Are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Say it again. What you were saying. Oh, just that, you know, that it's, it's, I said, it's important, like you said, to, to get over to these regardless, even if we're getting zero views, like we need to start setting that precedent, especially us in the in independent media, we need to start going over and sharing them there. And, you know, I still do both. I mean, clearly we need to, you know, we need to reach the people still. So I still put it, I still put it on YouTube. But right. I, we have to start doing it nonetheless. Otherwise, we're never going to see that change. Right, right. Well, and this is promising. I mean, most of my, I said 50 views. I mean, a lot of these have 15 or 25, but a lot of them are longer videos too that people probably um, aren't watching on uh, platforms like this. But, but I do have a video, um, the one about Ful Benjamin Fulford, David Wilcock, Robert David Steele, 613 views. I didn't even know. Nice. Pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty good there. Yeah, so there are a few views on there. Now, I, um, BitChute, because of that, I don't understand how I could ever make money from it. So you don't get many v eyeballs and you don't make any money. I am on, uh, I am uh, bullish on DTube, which is D.Tube. And um, that, like I said, it's affiliated with Steemit. This is what DTube looks like, everybody. It now, is rather primitive. Go ahead. Are you able to upload longer videos? I think this was. I think when this first started, there was some kind of a limitation on the the length. Am I incorrect on that? And I the think the length uh, and the size of the file. Yes, uh, there's no limitation that I think they say anymore. But man, the platform was shit. I mean, I would try to upload a video, and it would look like it went all the way through, and then it would just stop and. And then you'd have to go through that process a number of times. And the upload process was pretty opaque. That's like, why I gave uh, up. I mean, yeah, yeah. But it's working better now. Okay. And good. if you and you make money. That's the thing. If you look, um, like you're a soul. This is person I, a person I follow is pretty cool. 
Um, but you can see other YouTubers like Le uh, Luke, we are changes on here and he's got a great following. He makes like a hundred dollars, um, a video and that might be, uh, and they pay in crypto. They pay in something called steam dollars. Oh yeah. Suddenly That's... surge from about $2 a coin to over $6 a coin. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, actually, it's, we, I think we just mentioned cryptocurrency in another video. Uh, I think it was with Titus. And honestly, I, I've, I've been aware of it for a very long time. A, a former writer of mine, Tim actually left to completely pursue cryptocurrency and like, he's about to become, you know, well, I don't want to speak on it, but he, he's, he's doing very well for himself. And I, I just recently actually like last night for the most part, found out that I, I, I've known I've had about five, six, seven hundred dollars in steam over an, on steam it. And I finally just transferred it over and, and bought a bunch of chain link, which is a new, a new uh, thing going around right now. It's kind of a, you know, I actually, I'm very inexperienced when it comes to cryptocurrency, which I'm trying to get better at, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of revenue right there for, for simply just sharing your content, which it shows you how much Facebook and them really make off of you just pumping your information out there. Steam, it's a huge one. I think that's something that we should all be doing. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I'll go back to showing what it looks like. I mean, the thing is, is once you get a following, um, which is the hard part, um, you have built in money. You know, like I get for every post, I get about three dollars somehow from the people who follow me and however much influence they have with their tokens or whatever. When I upvote somebody, it gives them one cent. But I, uh, uh, from what I understand, if you're a big time person, you have a bunch of this influence cash or whatever they call it, steam power, then it could be a dollar for your upvote or maybe even more. And that's what I assume I have going on with people following me. But I mean, shit, that's three, $3 more than I ever make on any video on YouTube. I've never been able to monetize anything. Um, so it's amazing to me. And then, yeah, I cashed out. I had 91 steam dollars which I assumed were worth $91. And I went to cash them out and they were, it was worth like 260 bucks. I got um, Litecoin with it. And um, I'm really into crypto and we'll talk about, we'll talk more about, and um, because I think it, it is one of the solutions uh, to one of the problems and kind of um, DTube is, is emblematic of that. And then you post to Steam also is, is the thing to do. Um, let's see, do I have, if anybody's out there watching the show, who I invited to the show, please feel free to join. You have the link. Um, uh, so this is how things look. I, I might as well show you guys what things look like on here. It's pretty similar, um, but more, it seems like there are more people. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah, wow, those fires wild. are crazy. I did read, you think that's geoengineering or what? Yeah, it's, you know, it's really interesting. It's it, that's that's one of those kind of highly disputed topics going around based off even the, the previous kind of wildfires there. But I saw people that reported like at people that were on Facebook as well, people that knew actual firemen that were there, they are reporting that the things they saw afterward were there was no way it could have been just fire is what like firemen were saying. Really? So that's interesting. Yeah. Like, you know, people say direct energy weapons or, you know, who knows geoengineering. Or, I mean, or, yeah, I mean, it could be caused by you. And I actually think that there probably is to some degree a hand involved, whether that's accidental because they don't know what they're messing with, or maybe they're just trying to do things like that. I mean, and that's, that's total hypothetical. I have no idea, but it's, you know, with everything we know today, it's, it's kind of naive to just immediately dismiss something like that, you know? Yeah, no kidding. Hey, uh, we have Steve Outram joining us. Let me uh, get you in, Steve. Have you been following what we've been talking about? Can you hear me? Hello, I can hear you now. Dave, you been following what we've been talking about just now? We were just looking at the fires, but we were also talking about DTube and BitChute and a little bit about crypto. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Steemit. Uh, Titus Frost was actually the person that got me onto Steemit from his recommendations. And, you know, I like the idea that content is really the new mind. So you can use all this electricity on your computer trying to mine Bitcoins and other coins for the blockchain. It's really quite inefficient. Or you could do what you guys are doing, you know, create content, go live, record it on video, uh, and then put it out there and it sits on the internet forever. And you know, some of this content today, maybe it only gets 20 or 30 views, but who knows, like 30 years in the future, you could be talking about something that comes back as like a huge historical story. And you know, kids at schools all around the world are going to look at this video and, and watch it. And, and the point about the blockchain is 
it lives forever. So if you can set up this kind of economic engine right now where from one video you're making a few cents or a few dollars every year and then you have the capacity to produce thousands or tens of thousands of videos, if you look at that over a time frame of like 20, 30, 40 years, you know, potentially you could be doing really, really well. Yeah, and that's and what you're talking about. Let me stop screen sharing. Um, and what you're talking about, and sorry, sorry, uh, audience, if you're getting the same kind of um, glitching as I am, and the audio problems um, there, it sounds like it might be clearing up a little bit now. It's coming from you, Steve. People are saying um, it's like this. It's it's glitchy, but I don't know if I don't think it's my connection anyway. Um, what you're saying be, about it being there forever steam is, may seem kind of unique and DTube kind of unique is once you post it up there, you can't edit it or anything because it's been added to the permanent record, basically, and it can never be censored, be taken down. Is that my understanding of how it works? Well, well on, on Steam, it's after you post, you know, post out there, you can go back to it and edit it. And add things and things like that. So it's not actually a perfect record of information. And you know, I, I think there is a need for a, a product like that. I, I have a few ideas of, about that. Um, but you know, it, it's more—it's it, an alternative to WordPress or to Reddit or even to Facebook. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically a, a publishing and blogging platform. But you don't have to worry about it being fancy. You can anyone can use it. That's my audio. Shit, your audio's fucked up. Um, I don't know. You want to try rejoining? Because I think I was doing better with Ryan. You want to try rejoining? It's just kind of uh, fucked up. It's probably the bad. Do you have a bad connection? I'm, down, uh, I'm not in the office today, so I don't have my fiber. Uh, okay. I'll try to rejoin from my uh, Okay. Yeah. yeah, people in the chat are complaining. I yeah, really I, want I, Steve. Steve, I, I, go ahead. I was gonna say I love his idea. I love the his perspective on that. You know, I, that it, it's a it's kind of a the, the thing. The thing is about Steam. You, I, I steam it can be, could be censored. I should say, right? I mean, if we can edit it, it can be manipulated. I mean, anything can be. But I, I like the idea of that that it's kind of a permanent record of thing. And and he's right. I mean, you could you could essentially have an article get discovered ten years from now and make a bunch of money from it. You know, and it's I just I love that. It's a really interesting idea. Hey. It's neat, and I wanted to ask him with the value. The other thing that's neat is you get paid in this cryptocurrency, Steam dollars or Steam coins, I guess, which are somehow different. I have some of those too. Um, but like I said, the value just shot up from like two dollars of Steam dollar to over six dollars of Steam dollar. And if there's some value of this cryptocurrency beyond just being attached to this um, platform, which apparently maybe there is, I think that was the idea in the first place is that the currency itself can go up in value. And now every post I make is three times more valuable than it was a few days ago and makes me even more interested in doing it. And, and the thing is, is once it, like you, like you said, is we should be doing this. I mean, you look at people that have been doing it for a while, it looks like, and uh, uh, this video that we just played that was literally maybe a minute and a half just showing a fire off the 405, he's got $90. And that might be more, that might be, you know, six times that. I don't know exactly how the math pays out, but either way, I mean, it, and when you have that built in, he has 1,976 um, subscribers. Um, maybe I can, I, I could show it again just so you can see what I'm looking at. I definitely, um, <laughs> what's that? I said, I definitely need to get on D tube. That's I, I wasn't aware that like I, I still, cause I had that memory of it being really glitchy. Like you were talking about, I haven't really checked back since then. So it's definitely, there's, there's just, it's unparalleled. Like the way you can make money from this. I, I was blown away as well. Like mine, mine, I, I had just transferred over to, to Bitcoin to be able to transfer it, to buy the chain link. And, and just in that time period, because Bitcoin jumped up, I made like $300, you know, it's, it's just wild. Like it's, it's such an, and it, it's interesting that I've been hearing some weird talk about now because they're, they're being forced to address it. Right. So now you're seeing all these people in, in financial positions, almost kind of, they don't want it to become a new currency. I think that's what they're afraid of. So now they're trying to make it seem, oh, well, it's got, it's like a, it's like a store value. Like it's a like gold, right. Which is good oh, in you its own about way. Bitcoin? Yeah, 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 Bitcoin specifically, but it's that's it's dangerous. Like they're trying to kind of yeah. fold it into the fiat currency, you know. Yeah, it's weird what's happening with Bitcoin. And God, I wish I was having better connection, everybody. 
I don't think it's on my end. I don't think I can drop it. I don't think I can just drop my connection and get back in. So um, again, this is um, uh, just to go back and show. Um, I think I have a blog on here too. I have, oh, Jesus. Oh, that's that's Steve again. Oh, there we go. He's a little. <laughs> There's something wrong, Steve. We got like a. Uh, gosh, I want to have Steve on. Can you even hear me, Steve? I got to hang up on him. Steve, oh man, I'm seeing it feel clear up. Damn, that sucks. There, is there, is there any com issue coming from my end? Because I can try and rejoin as well. No, I no, you're 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 you know a little glitchy, but it's not it's nothing like his. You could okay. hear what was going on with him, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's DTube, everybody. Um, and the way we can do it is you you get on Steam it, um, Ryan active on there because I didn't know what I didn't know to do this and stuff. And then uh, we start following people, and then we just need to retweet e to re-steam each other and get each other in front of each other's audiences and stuff. And if we have enough people doing that, I mean, it's really a team effort on Steam. Um, so you want to leave comments on other people's videos and upvote other people's videos. But you can see Titus pretty much everything he does. He gets something like he's got you know fourteen bucks on this thing. I get like I said, usually three or something or sometimes a little bit more um but hey, oh there's titus nice right hey titus hey what's up guys hey i um i just um i just am on i was just showing your article here on steam it we were just talking about steam it and, and i had steve outram on oh he's joining again oh he's not buzzing this time steve outram said you told him about um steam it titus so um, I was asking you, I made a comment on your Israel video. My Israel video got pummeled <laughs> after it came out. They really fucked with the numbers. There, Steve, we don't have the bad uh, interference this time. Okay, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're good. Okay. Hey, tell me, okay, we said hi to Titus. I want to ask you, though, Steve, while we're on the topic, um, why is Bitcoin, I noticed that Bitcoin, um, I'm sorry, steam dollars or just went way up in value. What's that about? Oh, no, Yo, you're on mute. Just unmute yourself, Steve. You got, you can hear me? There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so most of the altcoins seem like they follow Bitcoin. So if there's a huge surge in Bitcoin price, the rest of the altcoin market gets lifted along as well. Uh, you know, and I think in the case of Steemit, if there was a spike, like when I looked at it last, it was around a dollar eighty, maybe. So and I'd put that down to going up alongside all of the other altcoins. But some of these cryptocurrencies may be benefiting from the current slowdown in Ethereum, which I don't know if you guys have heard about, but this thing called Crypto Kitties has basically just destroyed the uh, the whole Ethereum blockchain because it's sort of like Pokemon Go when that came out and went viral, uh, you know, it was unprecedented load on all of the servers. So the non-Ethereum based tokens, uh, such as Steam, they, they may be doing okay. Uh, there's been a bit of downward pressure on Ethereum and the other Ethereum based tokens like EOS, they seem to have been slipping down as well. So it could be related to that. Yeah, well, you know, it's weird because pretty much we're kind of slipping into cryptocurrency real quick, but um it's uh, steam dollars are over six dollars right now um wow. yeah all of a sudden i mean it went up in like two days all of a, so i don't know what the buying's about other stuff like most of the other altcoins in fact from what i've seen have been kind of down because i think everybody's chasing bitcoin which if, i i don't know and now it, uh, people say it's about i don't know it's gotta it seems like it's too high right now um, but I'm hoping when it when it kind of peaks and comes down a little that the other altcoins will will um, benefit from it. Um, but what I was saying, Titus, to uh, because I was kind of introducing Ryan to DTube, and I don't know if you post there yet. Um, but I was saying how you know it's it's automatic money once you have a following and stuff, and that what we really need to do is all be on there, all have our own audiences, and and basically just re-steam 
each other's stuff, right? I mean, is that kind of the strategy there is just to team up and kind of support each other, upvote each other, that kind of thing? Yeah, and that's why I've been building up Steam at Power for like well over a year now. And I have like 13,000 something Steam at Power. So when I upvote someone's like video or article, it's like a dollar forty for one of my votes if I give them a hundred percent. So you probably saw like maybe a small bump on uh, TLA's uh, articles I just upvoted. I just found you on there, and I just found Nathan on Steam it this past week. So I've been like upvoting your guys' stuff, which should. Put it up, and I know, I've known Steve uh, Outram from uh, Steam it for a while now. So it's nice to finally get the chat with you, bro. It's nice to see you here. Yeah, man. Um, I know we've like discussed a bunch on the blockchain actually, and I think uh, one of the major things about like Steam it is unlike the other cryptocurrencies, where they do sort of follow Bitcoin, and Steam it does follow it too. I agree with that. Um, they, Steam it also has other things like influencing the value. So you have the Steam it platform itself, which brings in value like Facebook has value. Um, and you also have smart media tokens and EOS. And now you have those other things like DTube. And I've been on DTube. I was putting every one of my videos up on there. In fact, my first video on there made something like 300 something dollars in Steam. Um, but since then, all those videos got removed one day and they fixed like a bunch of issues with the DTube like platform. And now I've been having to re upload all my work there. But oh. I've only got like four or five of my videos on there right now. But I did have like 30 videos up there or something and then they all just disappeared. But you get more value for your videos on DTube than you'll ever get on YouTube for them with monetization and you don't have to worry about censorship, and you don't have to worry about copyright, and BitChute coming up soon. I know from talking to the guy who runs that, that they're gonna monetize that with uh, Bitcoin. So soon you'll get Bitcoins for your BitChute videos. Like it'll be monetized similar to DTube. So I think those two platforms, DTube and BitChute, which are both uncensorable, both on the blockchain, uh, you know, BitChute runs on the BitTorrent, which Hollywood could not take down ever. So I think those are really the future of the platform, like the future of, for all of us. Okay, yeah, and what we're talking about, oh, did I, were you still talking to the audio? The audio is not perfect today, but um, okay. what we're talking about, everybody, is uh, solutions to the YouTube problem. I don't know, I Steve, I don't think you have a channel or anything. Um, you're, you, you appear on, as a guest on a lot of different shows though. Um, you were saying you were explaining your point when you first came on was that stuff stays there forever and, um, explain, and then, but you did say, I, I didn't realize you could edit. I had trouble editing at least on DTube after the video went up. Like I couldn't add a screenshot if the screenshot didn't go through and stuff. Um, but the DTube platform has gotten better. What do you mean? Why is it different as far as it being permanent um, up, as opposed to some other kind of platform? Well, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is about, you know, content being the new mining. And if content is monetizable and you guys are just constantly creating content all the time, then every single piece of that content you should put out there on the Internet and monetize it uh, because the Internet is, is forever. And you know, you might not think that anyone is ever going to go back and watch Lift the Veil from like a year ago, but who, who knows? Anything could happen. And I mean, the point is that you're doing the work anyway to create the content. And this is one area where I think Titus shows real leadership in getting the same piece of content out onto multiple, multiple platforms and channels. And you know, that's part of what we have to do to fight the YouTube and the, you know, the big brother deep state censorship. Uh, the, the other platform that you guys should take a look at is Kim.com's new one. Uh, it was called BitCache. Uh, but he's got the domain k.im, so it might be called k.im. And he's looking to do the same thing as well, which is to monetize content with Bitcoin, uh, but also reflecting that for a lot of content, people might pay a cent or two cents you know, to, to look at something or to like something.
but they're not going to you know go to the trouble of doing a Bitcoin transaction for it. So he's created a micropayments platform to, to do that. And what I you know I like Kim.com for a lot of reasons, but he has a proven track record of success in this space with like his mega platform and everything. So I think that that's going to be huge. Uh, and you know when when he launches that. Uh, I'm going to have my own channel on that. Uh, I've used the beta of the software already, and it's really, it's quite spectacular. It's it's really about how do we bring the ordinary people of the world onto the blockchain, and for them being able to watch and enjoy videos like fans of, of your shows, there's one way for them being able to create the content themselves and make money is another way, and then the crypto kitties that you know you can just make make a cute cat and breed it with another cat. And, you know, people are making $100,000 out of one of these cats that they get for $5. It's ridiculous, you know, but that's the future we're moving towards. What? They're making money Crypt off of crypto kitties? What is crypto kitties? Good question. It's, it's, it's huge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just come out. It, it was a uh, hackathon project at the University of Waterloo in October, and then they launched it on Ethereum, and uh, in the last two days, basically, no transactions can get through on the Ethereum network because it's completely clogged up with these these kitties. So I'm like, well, you know, I have, I have to go breed, breed some kitties and sell them. That's the only way I can make money on the blockchain today. But I couldn't even buy one of the kitties. That's 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 how busy it is. But yeah, the, the top one sold for 112,000. There's been two that sold for more than 100,000. And uh, it, I guess it's a way to teach kids, arguably women, about the blockchain. I guess there's a lot of men that are into crypto kitties as well. But the fact that you can make money from it, well, this is a new economic career, breeding virtual cats. <laughs> Man, it's so crazy. Maybe you can even explain the way even somebody like me can understand it. But I just got some EOS after being on Titus's show and him talking about it, even though I, I don't even know if I can say that. I don't even know if it's I just read something that we're not allowed to have EOS in the United States. Um, but go, go try to take it from me. Um, <laughs> uh, Ethereum is some kind of a platform as long as we're talking about cryptocurrency. It's some kind of a platform that allows you to run decentralized programs on it or something, right? And these crypto kitties are some kind of, it's basically, what is it? It's like a, uh, is it like a token pretty much? Well, or? yeah, so, so, so Ethereum is, is as you described it, you can run software on the blockchain. So that's their main innovation over the Bitcoin blockchain as they call it smart contracts, these distributed applications. And so the CryptoKitties is a distributed application, which means it's out there running and it suddenly becomes, even if they wanted to shut it down now, it's very difficult for them to do that because, you know, the, the fundamental idea of the platform is, hey, we're going to bring a computer, a giant internet that runs on everyone's computers at once. And so the programs that are running on this blockchain can never be shut down. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, it doesn't really scale to that. And, and it, it's looking like maybe CryptoKitties needs to have its own blockchain rather than running on the speaking of CryptoKitties. Doshi's just coming to the shop there. <laughs> yeah, Doshi's. Uh, yeah, he's he's over there in the background. Steve's looking at me. Yeah, he's coming. Everybody likes to see that. He, I, I, that's where I get most of my money. Uh, he's my money maker too, actually. So that's why people are are upvoting my content probably on Steemit. But is that uh, as long as we're on crypto? And some people their head their heads start to melt down when we even talk about it. Um, but that's the thing with the that we're finding out about Ethereum is, is that this new thing EOS is kind of a more advanced version that could ha maybe handle crypto kitties if it were more. Well yeah, yeah, I mean, Titus has, has made the point of uh, Ethereum is, is the new world order coin uh, because of who's backing it. And yeah, I mean, I, I, that's that's true. But you could also say generally blockchain technology is, is new world order solution to, you know, one financial system. But the guy, Vitalik Buterin, who's, yeah, they, they hold him up to be the founder of Ethereum. Uh, he won a scholarship from Peter Thiel uh, for the, the Facebook uh PayPal guy, and, you know, he, he got this first hundred thousand, and then suddenly he's the front man for this this whole invention. Uh, but he he owns uh, about four hundred thousand uh, ethers, and there's about ninety six million ethers. So he, he's less than half of one uh, percent. But it is being backed by major major corporations like you know BP, Microsoft, the state of Andhra Pradesh in, in India, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of stability in the 
Ethereum price compared to the Bitcoin price, which I think is being, you know, specifically engineered by the big money that's behind it. Um, there's some limitations in it technically, and that's what EOS is all about. EOS is like, we're going to have a more scalable version of Ethereum, but EOS is actually an Ethereum token. And most of these tokens are based on the Ethereum token. So Ethereum has kind of become the killer app for ICOs. And you know this boom of ICOs, what that's doing is before you had to go through these gatekeepers of venture capital companies to grow your business. But now you, people can just go out to the crowd, like with a Kickstarter or like with a GoFundMe, but with a token, with creating their own tokens. And, and this is where the smart media tokens com comes in, which is another thing I learned about from watching Titus' show. But, uh, you know, the, the founders of Steemers, uh, who, who are behind EOS as well, they've created this thing, Smart Media Tokens, and it's basically to enable shows like yours to get money from the audience. And you can do your own ICO uh, and, and issue these Smart Media Tokens. You can, you can get paid at it. Or, you know, if, there was, if, if a few of you would join together and, and collaborate and then form a network, suddenly you get a network that can pay everyone in smart media tokens and you know, perhaps sell advertising in smart media tokens as well, existing purely on the, on the blockchain. Uh, and you, know, you, you can replicate what works in the existing world, the Fox News or even the Alex Jones model, but replicate it in the blockchain so that no one player can come along and say, okay, we're shutting this, uh, this channel down. You know, You're what makes me nervous about this, the entire conversation is, is that it's, I mean, clearly we can see that there are ways to revolutionize pretty much everything through this medium, through this idea, I should say, you know, but the problem is, is that the average person today, like, like Nathan said, it's, it's, it's an, it's an overwhelming topic for a lot of people. And I, myself, I'm, I'm very inexperienced when it comes to blockchain technology, cryptocurrency. And, and so the problem is that the, the wrong people are in places right now to completely take advantage of that. You know what I mean? And so it just makes me nervous that I feel like I, and I, that's why I, I love the when you were talking about the Crypto Kitties idea, because that's a way that you can get the, the younger crowd and the, the, the people that don't know about it more involved in it, you know. But so how, how do we get past that? You know, because I feel like as this moves forward, the wrong people are the ones leading this movement at the, at the end of the day outside of people like you and people that are you know, taking charge of it on that side. Well, it's, it's available for anybody to participate in the crypto world. And, you know, it can be a bit daunting because it's not really a consumer grade experience yet. This is a technical experience. And even for geeks, there's, there's you know, a few challenges to jump through. But if you go somewhere like Coinbase and set up an account, you know, you download the Coinbase app to your cell phone and you validate your driver's license with your cell phone. It's actually pretty easy to do it. And that's all you need to get involved. You don't need to buy one Bitcoin for $18,000. You can say, look, I'm going to put a hundred bucks into Bitcoin. And you know, a, a strategy that I'm recommending to, to everyone that wants to get involved with crypto is, is take what you can afford, like you know, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars a month. And you, that's sort of your savings account. And every month you put that into cryptocurrency. And you might say, I'll put half into Bitcoin and half into new coins, or there might be one month where something looks particularly cheap. And so you put it into that. But you follow that strategy for sort of three to five years. It's a strategy of accumulation. You're not trying to trade it or sell it. You're just trying to accumulate it and accumulate the ones that look like they're going to continue go going up. Because th there's a fundamental mathematical and, and economic principle uh, within most cryptocurrencies, which is that the, it's the laws of supply and demand. So the supply is fixed and the demand is growing, that's going to push the price up. And that's what's happening with Bitcoin now. The supply has been fixed for a long time, but the demand wasn't really there. And now the demand is just absolutely exploding. You know, one of the big drivers of the Bitcoin growth is this Sunday, they're going to start trading Bitcoin futures on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And so a lot of these issues with Americans can't own a token that's a security or whatever, it seems like there are less... In uh, issues when it's actually a, a contract to receive that security at some point. So, you know, this is going to see a lot of big Wall Street money coming into Bitcoin and the market will be manipulated. You know, we've seen market manipulation going on already in, in crypto prices. And so the big algorithms and the big Wall Street money, the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans and, you know, all these uh, Templar banksters that rule the world, they're still they're still going to rule the world you know bitcoin isn't in itself a fix for that but what it does enable is ordinary people can kind of get away from their system and take more control over their ability to earn money to spend money and to retain money i'll, I'll just end on a quick example of that the recent uh saudi prince al-walid uh, bin talal 
he came out as an enormous critic of, of Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, now he's allegedly being strung upside down by his ankles and tortured in the Ritz Carlton in Saudi Arabia uh, with potentially 70 to 80 percent of his assets being seized. Now, if he'd converted his assets to Bitcoin, they wouldn't be able to seize them so easily. Right. Exactly. And, and um, we're, we're going to get off of, I think, and last Titus has something to add about cryptocurrency. I know my audience, half of them at least, um, can't take it. Um, and they're happy to, that half is the one that's happy to see Doshi every time too. Um, I did, uh, did you have anything you wanted to add about cryptocurrency while we're still on it, Titus? Yeah. And it'll just be a message to those people that don't want to hear about it, that can't stand it. Well, the powers that be and the market forces are driving the economy that way, whether they want to hear about it or not. And we're trying to inform them about cryptocurrencies because we want them to get in and involved in it on the ground floor so they're not left behind and trying to convert their fiat currency over into cryptocurrency when it's too late and they'll all be broke. If you guys all jump in now, we can all work together and get some of that cryptocurrency before it becomes a new world order coin or something like that. So, I mean, if they don't want to just be like, you know, servants to the system, then the time is to try to decentralize it, which means we all have to jump on it while we can. Yep, that's what I've been telling people, you know, and and some and it's hard. It's hard to get it through their through their heads uh, because you're stuck in a paradigm of thinking a dollar is money. And and I try to get people to think, you know, don't think of it as something. Don't think of it as whether it's perfect because a lot of people will tell you it's a scam, it's manipulated, it's it's new world order, whatever. Think of it compared to your US dollars or your, you know, or your euros or, or whatever it is and think about whether it might be preferable at least to that because there, we know that those are completely controlled, can be printed more at any time. And during the next financial crisis, I mean, there are gonna be currency crises left and right. And that's why you have people piling into this stuff. So that's why we talk about it is because it satisfies our goals is which is being decentralized. And, you know, you want to think about what you can do to change the world and to kind of walk the talk. Also, I mean, if you're talking about um, central banks being evil, then do something about it, you know, sell your, your dollars and, uh, and, and, and make it crap. I mean, whatever it is, I mean, we don't want to be living under this slave, uh, this debt based uh, system of slavery where we where we get paid in this government issued fiat money so and we're we're trying to help you out even though you don't like to think about money a lot of you don't like crypto is uh, um, unfortunately and unfortunately this what you're doing right now watching a show where people who do research and have specialized information and you have guys like Steve Outram who was the CEO you know youngest CEO of a public company in Australia. Um, I mean, we, we really kind of have done some research and, and we're trying to impart that to you. And this is a way to take what you get from the internet and not just learn that Sandy Hook is a hoax, but maybe learn something that, that provides for your, your retirement um, or helps you pay off credit cards or any of those things that you want to do. So that's why we talk about it. Um, I'm going to move on from it. I just want, uh, we were talking earlier about the problem with YouTube and what some uh, options are to fix that. And one thing that I am um, uniquely on, and, and this is the only show, I've the only live show I've done for a while where I'm not simulcasting live on Twitch. Um, so is this platform Twitch show people here, even though again, you're all looking at Doshi. Um, I'll show you what Twitch looks like because I showed you the other platforms. Um, this is my last show. I have a dopey face on me. Um, this is owned by Jeff Bezos and Amazon.com. Um, it likewise, you don't necessarily get a big audience, but I, because I had that hard, hard switch from YouTube to Twitter, I got some built in viewers. I get about 40 or 50 live viewers at a time on there. And I do think like BitChute and maybe like DTube, 
that there is this is a platform for gamers but they have this new thing called in real life um, which is one of their most popular um, segments and people are tuning in to you know they're trying to watch something live other than video games on there and it's a unlike the other platforms it's user friendly it's beautiful it has a great app um, and they don't censor as far as we can tell um, if you do live content it's a very unique place to put live content and um, it's another place where if there are more of us on there supporting each other you can do things like on my channel i can host other channels so when i'm not live and if titus were on there or steve Atram were on there or, or ryan was on there um then their show would come up on my channel and and we can go and it can go vice versa and you can almost make a, a television station on there or a station that's running content all the time it's it's another thing to do and you have to use broadcasting software to do it um, but I think it's something that also is going to be up and coming as uh, people diversify from YouTube. So um, that's one other option. I, I do invite people to join me on the, uh, you know, um, run your channel when my channel's not on there. So I haven't heard from you. As, uh, we haven't heard from you as much lately, Ryan. Why don't we move on to a new problem? You, you tell me, can, what do you think? of as um, one of the problems we're facing content creators um, but as human beings perhaps or either way um, and I don't know if you have any solutions for how you might fix that well I mean you know I thought about it a, minute, a while before for the show on kind of what the biggest problem I felt was in general and it's it, this is more of a lofty kind of idea but I think we can all agree that I think the, the thing I run into the most on a daily basis when I, whether when I'm dealing with anybody is, is people that are still completely caught up in the two part, the two party paradigm. The idea that there, that there, that this still exists, that there is two separate political parties and that everything you do can be split between them. Right. That it's all. And I think it's just so, I think that is something we, I am trying to focus on more often than not is trying to dispel that notion. And I, I know that doesn't apply to like tangible problems we have in front of us, but I just feel like that to me is the biggest issue that, that like the first thing I want to try and solve. I think if we can get people past that idea and realizing that the thing that they're being pushed, you know, that's being put in front of them is just a, a big show. I think we will immediately get a huge, a lot more people that are invested into the kind of things we're doing, you know, and that to me, that's just my, my okay. opinion. I think that's the largest problem. I don't know facing. if I lost his audio again. Yeah, sorry if I cut you off. It's because your audio goes out. Um, what do you have ideas on on how we change that beyond just doing what we do and putting the word out on the streets? Right, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the hardest part about it, right? Is that it's it's an it's an idea, you know. So I mean, how do you how do you basically we just need to continue to show people proof of that. That's my solution. You know what I mean? Every opportunity we can show somebody that they're advocating for the same thing. I thought a perfect example of that was when, when, when the whole bombing of Syria and basically these people who were the day before criticizing Donald Trump on every aspect, all of a sudden united on how amazing everything was. And you know, it's like, that's a very clear sign that war is, is, is something they're both behind, you know? And it's like, we just need to point those things out as much as possible. add on that topic otherwise I'll, I'll, well, that's something where we we kind of have to talk about it. i think we all well actually you know what i i can ask a question because we do have one guest here who is on the right left divide a little bit if i might dare say so and that's steve outram who is a is maga all the way i believe and still a, a trump supporter what do you what do you think of what do you think of that steve yeah, well, I mean, it puts me in a difficult ideological position because I'm not a supporter of Zionism and Trump is pretty obviously a Zionist. But, uh, you know, the way I live with myself at night is I don't think he could have become president if he hadn't cut a deal with some incredibly powerful group with the power of life and death over even presidents, you know. So it's sort of a trade-off we have to get in order to have, you know, death to the TPP and a lot of these other crazy deals. It looks like we're not going to have war in Syria. You know, there's a lot of bluster going on, Israel and, and uh, Saudi, and we're going to go get Iran. I've seen this my whole life, you know, 20, 30 years. They're always saying this. And what does it lead to? It leads to massive arms deals. It doesn't really lead to so, yeah, they have proxy wars or whatever, but there's a greater Israel plan. 
And there's no point talking about Republicans versus Democrats when all of the people in Congress have signed on to the Greater Israel Plan. So, you know, democracy is an illusion. We're, we're all basically lackeys of this state. What's the solution? You know, possibly have some more political parties in the existing system, but the existing system is so broken and corrupt, I don't think you can do anything. So the best solution that I've heard in years was on your show, Nathan, which was Vid Armani talking about agorism and that we can just use these technologies like Steemit and DTube and the blockchain, you know, to li live in a system where we don't have to interact with the existing system at all if we don't want it. We just sort of rise above it and disappear from it. How do we do that? Might as well ask. And again, sorry guys if it's, it cuts in and out a little bit uh, so we don't hear every word, but um, agorism is the idea of basically just kind of declaring your own sovereignty, um, I believe, um, which is something I talk about sometimes uh, as much spiritually as otherwise. But um, uh, how, how do we do that practically? And you heard uh, Vin Armani, who would, who would be interesting on this show, it's just he's busy with his other career, um, which I'm sure we all would like to be able to do. Um, is, what do you? Th what do we do to 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 do that? To to break away and to really, it's just to not participate basically in the system. Um, what are the ways beyond cryptocurrency, which I I think is probably number one in my mind. Um, but are there other ways we can do that? Well, I, I would say travel is enormous. Like get get a passport, and I don't know what the statistic is today, but the one I heard was that twenty five percent of Americans have a passport. Uh, which, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in New Zealand and we're at the other end of the world. And for us to go anywhere, we need a passport and we need to travel. So it's quite a common cultural thing down in New Zealand, Australia, that when people finish high school, they go for like a, a year or so backpacking overseas before they start college. And that gives people a really amazing, you know, grounded basis. And e even just to get out of your state and travel around the rest of the country a bit. And this is particularly for Californians. You know, I've been to 43 states of the US and America is not like California at all. And all the people in California think that America is exactly like California. So just get get out and see, see the world and, and you realize that you don't have to be so set in your old and traditional ways of doing things that, you know, there's the whole wide world out there and people don't really know the answers, which means just be yourself and chart your own course. All right. Oops. Okay, great. Uh, Titus, I haven't heard from you on this one. You're going to be different. You're like me. You don't like Donald Trump, I think, because he's a Zionist, or at least uh, you're not 100% behind him. And I think we're both critical of these um, these alt-right figures who are maybe planted in there. Um, what do you think is the way that we break beyond the right-left divide? Well, one of the biggest problems we face, and we all talk about all the time, is the mind control which in this case would be soft mind control, also known as information control. And, you know, if we really want to break away from the left versus right thing, the system itself has gotten so corrupt that it's going to be very difficult to do that without a full system reset. And fortunately, uh, the U.S. Constitution does grant us the ability to do that. If you look up Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, you can invoke that which we'll call a constitutional convention, and you can fire the entire federal government and then go back to a constitutional basis and then re-elect everyone um, based on that. And then we can get rid of this ridiculously overgrown, completely corrupt federal government and replace it with something much smaller that actually adheres to the Constitution. Now, that's like a massive you know, step that we would have to take as a country and it would lead to, you know, various different problems. But those problems would be far less than what we're dealing with. Sorry, I'm not worried. <laughs> Titus has a real job, uh, which, which uh, we, we appreciate here since we're doing our show out of our dad's garage with our cat. Um, but we have ideas for that to get away from that too. How hard is it to, to act? You, you said Article 5 of the Constitution lets us basically replace the government. What kind of a movement would it take to, to, to make something like that happen? Are you still, you can still get your saw. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, sorry. The uh, air compressor's off. Um, 
basically what it takes is a vote of the states to do that. I believe it's a two thirds majority vote by each and each state has to do that. I believe at the Senate level or first at the House level, then the Senate level, or it can be a vote by a sitting president. So John Mack, so John Mack was actually was actually on the idea, idea that he yeah. would, if elected, invoke that and fire himself and the rest of the federal government at the same time, which is why I supported him for president. Not because I want that crazy guy in the office, because I don't want anyone in the office. You know, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I don't even believe in having a government, but if we're going to have one, it should at least adhere to the law. And the law in this country is the United States Constitution. Everything else has to adhere to that. And our government doesn't adhere to that at all. The admiralty law system they've set up doesn't adhere to that at all. And unless we invoke Article 5, I don't see any other way to get back to the Constitution in this country. The government's just grown too corrupt and too big. I agree with you, and um, I, I'm always glad to see, like, the, a lot of people say, you know, the country was founded by Freemasons, and, you know, it's in the Constitution and everything, but I'm one of those that thinks the Constitution is pretty good. You know, if we have to have a government, and there are a lot of arguments for reasons that we should have a government, and I could give a lot of reasons why I think the, the system, the way it was set up, is pretty good. It's just it requires participation. And the most difficult thing is now that people don't really participate, their candidates are chosen for them and they allow that through that soft mind control that Titus was just talking about. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult and it's hard to imagine getting two thirds of the government to, to vote for voting, you know, voting themselves um, into obscurity. Um, but it's certainly a, a dream we can all we can all think about. Um, I am interested since we talked about agorism, uh, closely linked to that, I believe, or associated with it is anarcho capitalism, and I could use an explanation to what that is, Titus. Oops, you're still on mute. Basically, anarcho capitalism is just the idea that. You know, we go to a private system where you don't have, you know, a government collecting everything. So with stuff like, you know, in the modern day age with things like uh, smart contracts and things like that, instead of, you know, the government going around and collecting all of the money to build a road through taxes, we could just say, okay, we want a road built here. Let's put out a smart contract on that. Everyone else that wants that road built can put whatever they think worth towards that. And then through voluntarianism, that road gets built. And normally it gets built better than what the government would do, where you know they just go around with a monopoly of force and take all of our money with the taxes. And then you know 50% of it goes to grift. And then you know another 40% of it goes to some other crap. And then 10% of it actually goes to the road project, which then drags on forever and ever and ever because it goes to whatever contracting company they decided to pick because it's, you know, the governor's brother or something, you know what I mean? And it never, ever gets done. We have road projects here in Boston that have been going on for like 10 years without anything being done. And we pay like a ridiculous amount of money in taxes, 28 cents per gallon. We pay excise taxes. We pay, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And all that money goes to waste, basically. So with anarcho-capitalism, you're privatizing these things that the government does now. It's just shifting it to the private sector and decentralizing it and getting rid of this, you know, monopoly of force that's called government. In order to do that, in order for anarcho-capitalism to work and in order for democracy to work it also. So the thing people would probably argue with this anarcho-capitalism, a completely voluntary system where you, like you said, people say, hey, we need a road. So they voluntarily chip in to hire a contractor, I suppose, to, um, to, make the, to, to do the road work. Um, of course, the reason we have taxes is because people don't volunteer their money right? when given the choice. So you end up with a lot of deadbeats in there. I think um, Ryan had to go. Um, so if anybody is watching, anybody else who got my invite, please go ahead and join anytime.
I said I would max out at three. Um, how do you prevent that? I mean, doesn't it require just a very, very high level of participation from every single person in the community or, or, um, or does that manifest as people start to go that way? Or um, don't you agree it's a difficult system considering the way people think right now? It would be difficult to go straight from where we are now, living under a nanny state, to that system, which is why I advocate for going back to a constitutional basis in the United States, because that's like a much smaller leap, right? That's, you know, going back to like a government that's, you know, legal and people know what that type of system is. We've gone through that in America since 1776, and it's just been corrupted since then. But if you want to go to, you know, an anarcho-capitalist state, that's a much bigger step. And you'd have to do that at a global level, right? So like, say we did that in the United States and I get like the issue about, you know, how do you get people to voluntarily pay? Well, you know, businesses along that road that you need to be built would all benefit financially from having the road built. So they would all pay towards the building of that road. They all pay in corporate taxes already if for, you know, crap they don't even want or need like wars and shit. But if you did go to an anarcho capitalist state like say in america like right now what would happen is because the banksters run the world they just use another country to come in and take you over like you know the war of 1812 with the united kingdom so basically you know you couldn't do it unless you were able to do it globally all at once which is sort of like a pipe dream right so what we really need to do and i think what we really need to focus on is you know the convention of states Article five, getting back to a you know constitutional America. And then once we've done that, we can work on the rest of the countries around the world. But America is sort of like the head of the snake. You know what I mean? We're we're what they use to control everything else with the military. So if we can take back, you know, the military and the power, then we can use that to free the rest of the countries around the world, sort of systematically. Act type thing. But in the current state of affairs, we can't just go straight to a anarcho-capitalist system because then, you know, God knows which country it would be, but they would use one of those countries to invade America and take us over and bank and all those types of things. So, all right. So, yeah, I think it's I think getting to that anarcho-capitalist thing is well, like you said, it's it's kind of a a pipe dream, but something that's really beautiful at the other end. Um, my feeling is for what could be a possible solution uh, to the government problem, and we have a government problem, is starvation, is to starve the government of, of, our, of their taxes um, in whatever ways uh, possible, just by stopping uh, participation in the system, um, which I guess the, uh, the um, agorism kind of points to. But, um, you know, doing things that do, maybe making less money, but like I, I don't pay taxes, you know, I wouldn't have to. Um, it, it would all be write offs and stuff. And I, I wouldn't have enough money that I would need to. And, and people say there's there's no law that you have to anyway. It's more cheating on your taxes. If you have a regular job, you don't have much, much choice. Um, but the ways, you know, doing things for yourself doing things in cryptocurrency, um, maybe, and not necessarily in ways that are illegal. Um, but for example, I think with cryptocurrency, they can't tax you with capital gains unless you actually sell it. And I don't plan to sell any of my crypto. I might change to other kinds. Um, but I think the system, ultimately, there isn't enough to support it. And in fact, just naturally, with the coming economic downturn, I think they are going to be starved. And we have an insolvent government. And the system will basically collapse under its own weight. Um, and, and it's going to be chaos, uh, for sure. But I think that, I mean, I think the reset is coming. And I think um, there will be a chance to establish some kind of new world order. And it's just a question of who does it. And um, probably the people who are able to do it are the people with all the gold and gold is now Bitcoin. And so that's a chance um, for the, those people who have those philosophies. You know, I was just thinking, what if they went, if people say, oh, they're going to regulate Bitcoin. And I said, well, maybe. Um, but first of all, if they do that, they can't regulate every cryptocurrency. I don't think people will just switch to something else or something else. And 
And once you start dealing in it and you start getting the concept of it, you don't want to deal with any other kind of money. You don't want to deal with fiat currency anymore. Um, and so, but I was thinking, right there, let's say they try to pass a law completely outlawing Bitcoin or something like that. It's going to take them a while, first of all. And when they get there, you have guys like the Winklevoss twins who are going to be coming in lobbying Congress with the same uh, bait that everybody else had, which is money. And they're going to have money and power behind them because of this cryptocurrency to be able to, to maybe make a change uh, in favor of, of maybe the kind of ideals that people like, like us have. So um, not to go back to cryptocurrency, but, but uh, besides calling out the alt-right shills and doing the things we do on our show and trying to shake up the paradigm, um, which is, I think, you know, what, what, what we try to do, maybe less Steve, cause he, he likes the, the one he likes the guy in charge right now. I, I don't like the government, you know, period. And I'd like to see it starve to death. So, um, Titus, so now I think we, we talked about the right left paradigm. What do you, what do you think, uh, if you had to pick a problem that you think is really important right now and that we could maybe try to solve, what, what would it be? Well, I think right now with all this stuff going on with Hollywood, you know, you have everyone sort of focusing on the sexual abuse. I think it's a good time to, you know, highlight the pedo gate stuff just so that we can possibly get, you know, some arrests for that. And like one of the only things about Trump that's like still a positive is the fact that I thought he was going to arrest Hillary Clinton. And I thought he was going to arrest John Podesta. And I thought we might be an investigation of Comet Ping Pong acknowledged publicly and privately. And we have all these sealed indictments and things like, I don't know, I just feel like if we keep the pressure on that, you know, I mean, we're even seeing Podesta like melt down in public and flip out at people just for asking them questions about this stuff. So I feel like if we keep the pressure on with like Pedo Gate and Pizzagate and all that, that we might actually get some sort of justice for that. That's why I've been focusing on that for months. Um, just because I think that's like the most pressing thing because it's about abuse of children. And it's something that I think we could actually possibly actually see maybe even like a limited hangout of arrest. But still, a limited hangout of arrest would be better than nothing. You know what I mean? So, Right, right. Well, and I think... Do you think then, I think we, um, well, everybody, that's the great thing about sexual abuse, especially sexual abuse of children, is that nobody's for it. You know, even the bad guys are going to at least say they're not for it. Um, but everybody, and everybody has an emotional reaction to it. Um, you know, most people of a certain age have children themselves and um, can't imagine someone doing that to their own children and, and want to make a difference. So it's definitely a way to mobilize people more than they would be necessarily on other topics like chemtrails or something. Um, do you think that we're making any, do you think the, it, some people think the arrests of these, these high profile figures for sexual abuse or sexual misconduct, I guess you could say in a lot of cases, um, is a smokescreen for child abuse and that they're trying to distract away from it. Now, my personal opinion is that, that it's, that's not the case and that this was some sort of natural outgrowth of some kind of change in the consciousness and the mainstream media, for some reason, um, who I don't think we can argue that Trump is in control of, decided to start outing people and it caught fire and now, um, and for some reason in this time, people believe the victims of these um, deviants, I guess. Um, although in some cases, you might think that people are getting worse punishment than they deserve for behavior that way maybe wasn't that bad. Maybe some people will say that. Some people argue that about Roy Moore. Some people might argue that about Al Franken. Um, some people say it's guys being guys. But I, I tend to think differently. And I'm wondering what you guys think. Um, I think I tend to think it's not a smoke screen and that maybe it's a stepping stone. If people are accepting 
one kind of victim of sexual abuse, more adult victims, um, maybe they'll start to accept things like what, what uh, Corey Feldman is talking about. And maybe some other people will come out um, to call out people from Hollywood uh, or other, other circles for that kind of thing. Do you, do you have an opinion about that, Steve, about um, where we're going with stuff and the child abuse stuff? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think what we saw uh, under the Obama administration is you know, Hollywood really, really pushing the sexual degeneracy, you know, pushing pedophilia, pushing incest, even pushing bestiality. And where does it all stop? It really went unchecked. And what we're seeing now is that that sort of stuff is starting to be checked. And I, I don't think that this is a coincidence. I think that this has all the signs of a systematic takedown. Now, what kind of system could take down so many sexual predators at once in a one-by-one -one fashion? Well, you know, just, just a theory, but the NSA would have access to that information, what these people have talked about in their most private conversations, phone calls, everything. And, you know, if these people had ever spoken about being abused by a powerful figure, that would be logged in a, in a computer somewhere, which could be used for something like this. Uh, and, you know, potentially it's phase one of a much bigger takedown getting the public ready to accept the next level of it. Because I think one of the challenges with pe Pedogate is that people just can't imagine that anyone would do this to children, let alone that famous, you know, leading figures in their lives and, you know, a huge interconnected network of it. And unfortunately, when you do the research, you realise that this is ac absolutely what's been going on. It's been going on for years and years. People as high as the Prime Minister of Great Britain have been caught you know, and not just one prime minister. And uh, the, the same, like Dennis Hastert was the speaker oh, of the Hastert house. So speaker. this this stuff is is very very real. Um, you know, as as to is the whole Q thing a, a LARP? Is this is this just a psyop to wear us down? I point you to John McCain's ankle bracelet. Or sorry, ankle boot. Why did that ankle boot change? Is it because he's got brain cancer and he just doesn't think very clearly and none of the other people around him thought to point it out to him? Well, why was he using a different different arm on the cane? You know, So it's much more likely that he's got an ankle bracelet. Hillary Clinton seen in that same type of boot as well. So there's something going on with these sealed indictments. There's something going on. There have been a lot more pedophile and sex traffic arrests under Trump. You know, that's that's a fact now. And uh, let's hope that that's just accelerating. You know, I, I think um, that, that that's that's you know, he was elected on the promise of lock her up, and I'm still holding out hope that that's what's going to happen. And I think that the the other MAGA people that I know. We believe it. And you know, look at how this Trump-Russia thing has turned around. For a while, that was the dominant narrative for, for a year, that Trump is a Russian agent and a Russian mobster and colluding with the Russians. And that all has fallen apart. And now that's pointing back to Andrew McCabe, this guy Peter Strzok or whatever, uh, you know, having an affair with an FBI attorney. Like All of this corruption within the FBI and the DOJ is being totally exposed right now and this is the type of thing that trump said he was going to do so you know it's too early to give up to say well you know hillary's not in jail but jerusalem's the capital of israel now so trump's a sellout and will never achieve anything i i don't know i i still have faith we'll see what happens but if we're talking again in a year and she's still walking free and Podesta's still walking free then you know i'll i'll be turning on him just like you guys <laughs> do you have anything to say about that titus i know you're moving around yeah, I'm actually going to have to sign off soon. I'm okay. going to have to leave work, but no, I'm actually in my actual work office. This is kind of strange to be live streaming from in here, but here I am. Uh, what do I think about all that? I have high hopes that maybe Trump will keep all of his campaign promises. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, as I tweeted out earlier, um, he... You know, someone tweeted out a thing. It was like seven or eight campaign promises that Trump made, and he kept like all of them. And unfortunately, I didn't like some of his campaign promises, but he is keeping them. And the one that's left, basically, is Hillary Clinton not being in jail. So if he is going to go like nine for nine or something on his promises, that that's got to be one of them that he still has yet to keep that he should keep. I also just saw that it came out that Mueller is like on Clinton's like side. 
like the mute guy investigating the Russia thing, like some new emails or something came out. I just saw uh, Chris Simpson's YouTube channel, Bait and Sketch, it used to be called. Just did a report and I saw it on Steam it about that. And he's always very accurate. And I'm sure when I go look through it, there'll be links and things like that. Um, the other thing, what was I going to say? Uh, about Oh, yeah, the leg thing with McCain. That is really odd. And I did a video on that, and I documented that on Steemit as well, that McCain did switch his leg cast, which doesn't make any sense, like you said, Steve. Like, why would he do that? There's no reason to switch it. He couldn't have possibly recovered from the injury he supposedly had in the time frame, and there would be no reason to put it on the other leg. Like, when you get a cast off, you don't put it on the other leg. The other leg is stronger because it's been the one being used the whole time while you had the cast on. So that whole excuse, anyone that's played sports knows that. That whole excuse is just bogus. It's totally bogus. So I don't know. You know, maybe those guys are- I have to say, like what you said, you said, uh, you said it's not, it, it's impossible to understand why, why he would do it. And it's just so crazy. That's what I think too. I, I, is he just fucking with people? I, I just, that's what I thought to myself. Maybe he's just fucking with people. Um, although I don't know if that's something he would do because it's so absurd. Of course he would know. And if he had an ankle bracelet, it would be on one ankle. So was he taking it off to show he didn't have an ankle bracelet on that ankle? Or was it just to mess with people who are following this Q thing? I mean, that's such a weird story. I didn't report on it for that reason because I couldn't figure it out. I mean, it doesn't make any damn sense. Um, but I guess, um, you know, to Steve and it, the, the NSA stuff was something Q talked about. And, and I, was, I was maybe grabbing onto that idea that that was the reason some of these women were coming forward because the NSA told them they had backup evidence for them um, in case things went wrong or in case these guys wanted to say they were lying. So, you know, we can always hold out hope for that and that he's going to go further. And, and I agree. I think that the child abuse stuff, um, particularly stuff like satanic ritual abuse, which is what's involved with a lot of these elite people, it's very hard to accept. It was maybe one of the last subjects of truth um, that I got into just because I didn't even want to believe it was possible. So maybe people seeing this... Um, unexpected sexual misconduct from people that they might have trusted before maybe people seeing that is the next step down to exposing the rampant pedophilia and if we don't believe that donald trump is involved in that which and he's pretty good friends with epstein and and there are a lot of stories and he has that modeling agency um you know with with girls that are you know under 18 and stuff coming in on h1b visas and um there's there's some questions there but it, but if he's if if he's straight i mean there is an argument you can make that we're going down the right road for solving it so um, and Titus, thanks for joining me. If you have to go, by the way, uh, anytime, but thanks for joining us. If you're not able to say goodbye, it's been great having you, but stay on as long as you want. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. I was just going to point out something, which is about a year ago, there was a coup at Fox news and basically Rupert Murdoch's sons took over Fox news and they kicked out Roger Ailes, the founder, uh, basically in a sexual uh, harassment scandal. And then Bill O'Reilly lost his show in a sexual harassment scandal. And shortly thereafter, Greta Van Susteren and Megan Kelly as well were, were kicked off the network. And it's interesting that that hasn't been mentioned in really much of the coverage I've seen of this whole sexual harassment thing. But it makes me wonder, you know, was this an organized plan going back as long ago as, as this, uh, sort of a, a deep state coup, uh, you know, taking out one other massive power network in the deep state. And I think that, you know, if, if you look at the Clintons as not just Hillary and a political campaign, but, you know, an organized crime gang, it does seem that that gang is fighting against, you know, other entities and organizations uh, that want them to go down. And, and, you know, what we're left with, it may be just as evil and corrupt as that gang. I, I don't know, but I think certainly we're a lot better off if that gang gets punished you know we can all have faith in the justice system again yeah because of the the precedent that would set which would be absolutely astonishing to see someone like hillary clinton at that level actually get taken down and thrown into jail 
as I said before, even if we just get like a limited hangout of arrests for all this stuff, that would be better than what we've had for the past, I don't know, since JFK was killed basically right in front of everybody. These guys have never been held accountable for any of the major things that they've done wrong. So if we can get even a limited hangout, that would be great. And it's uh, very nice to see you, Defango. Um, What's, actually, up? What's up, Dean? I actually have to bail, guys. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I'd love to stay on and chat with y'all. If I can get back on when I get home, I will. But I got like 30-minute ride, so peace out. Okay. See All right. See you, Titus. You hey, Defango, your mic's up a little hot right now, um, if you can adjust that. This is Defango. I think people know Defango know my show. Thanks for joining me, man. We wanted to get all kinds of different uh, types of people on this show. Defango is famous now for going after Robert David Steele. And I think, um, I don't know if you know Steve Outram, but he, he knows you. So yeah, he, told know. Hey, a, he told me you're a genius, by the way. So that that's was pretty the, good. That's, that's the story. That's the story that's allegedly out there. But I mean, uh, <laughs> I would probably be a lot better off in my life if that was, you know, a hundred percent true. So it's, it, you know, thank you. But I mean, it seems like there's a lot of weird stuff. I was actually just listening in on so the, some of the Q stuff you guys were talking about. And I think everybody is kind of spot on with a lot of it. Cause it does seem like, you know, there should be something going on with Hillary Clinton and that whole deep state affair. But I feel like there's still a lot more players that are going to be exposed. Um, I was uh, talking to some individuals too. And I heard that, uh, the 7th, December 7th, that there was going to be a little bit more information that might be trickling out uh, associated with some of this stuff that we've been looking at. Well, that's we don't tonight, have right? long to wait since that's today. And uh, and uh, by the way, there are protests going on today, too. I didn't mention that earlier in front of Verizon stores for this um, net neutrality. And I don't know if we think that's a problem, too. But, I, but actually, since we were on cue and Defango has some um, unique perspective on this, um, particularly since we talked about it, how you, you, I mean, you're the puzzle guy, you're the ARG puzzle guy, basically. I mean, you live stream and, and you kind of end up promoting these puzzles like Cicada 3301 and Tengri, which I don't really know that much about. I, I found out about the SVV, of course, and, and how that was related to Ohmcoin. And that was kind of another one of those, uh, ARG type things. Um, it turned out, um, you said when you read the Q post that they kind of read like an ARG, and that's kind of where I ended up coming down on it. I mean, what what is am I saying accurately? What you no, you're said pretty to accurate me? actually. You're pretty accurate. Um, yeah, when I first started coming, it first started coming out. Um, I was seeing some kind of like uh, what would you call them outliers that seemed to connect to some of the stuff that I had seen from the Cicada 3301 puzzles this year. There was like mentions on October 13th of the white rabbit and then i just recently found a mess a mention to follow the white rabbit from september 25th and it's on bitstream and there's like a cicada 3301 channel that's been posting videos and that seems to be like the first time that it came out you know at least from what i've seen this year and there was i did a lot of research last night into some bitcoin puzzle there's a puzzle with like a bunch of bitcoin that's up for grabs right now but this puzzle seems to play into everything that we've been looking at with like the Q stuff. Like it's an Alice in Wonderland chess set. It's got, it looks like the final battle that Lewis Carroll talks about. If you read the Alice in Wonderland, he marks it out. He maps it out being like a chess board. But it, it was really interesting to me because this is from 2015 and this is on the blockchain, like the Bitcoin blockchain. There's hidden messages on transactions that basically tell a story are that tell a story that's very, very similar. And uh, part of like, I guess this ARG that was created for it said to follow the white rabbit. So I don't think that you're wrong when you say that there's probably a big ARG connection to this whole thing. Cause to me, it seems like it is pretty solid. If I look at the Cicada 3301 stuff and then there's even unrelated stuff, well, seemingly unrelated stuff from 2015 when Cicada 3301 was doing this BBC puzzle um, I believe that it's connected to that as well. So I thought that was very strange indeed. But, you know, with all the connections that we've had with the WikiLeaks drops and this year with that puzzle, every time that puzzle had an update for the first half of the year, the same time, you know, WikiLeaks would be dropping something. And it was like, the fuck? You know, okay. it was weird. Yeah, that is weird because I see WikiLeaks and even Kim.com. I, I, I'm suspicious of everybody. You guys know that. 
Um, but when I see all these same people and same entities kind of tied together, um, you know, I start to get suspicious that it is some kind of organized thing. I think, you know, what would be really helpful for me to Fango is if you could tell everybody, including myself, what is an ARG? Like, can you explain what that is? Well, an ARG seems to be what you call an alternate reality game or an alternative reality game. Both of are synonymous and they're generally games that are associated with the internet so it you have to solve puzzles find things in real life uh if you've ever heard of something called geocaching geocaching is like a form of an arg where basically you find some uh, gps coordinates and you have to go find a box somewhere and then you can write your name down in and stuff and what it seems to be is like uh, Cicada 31301 started off as an ARG back in 2015. And um, I don't think that they've really ever said anything different. You know, there's been a lot of like, you know, hoopla about it, but they've always said that they were just, you know, looking for intelligent people. And over the years, we've kind of like, you know, understood that they're looking for intelligent people to help, A, help them uh, build things and B, help them build, make more puzzles. And what, that's why it seems like a lot of the new puzzles are different than the earlier ones is because different people are making them. Okay. And there's been a few. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, for, go ahead. And I was just going to say, so an ARG is like a game. So like there's the closest thing to an ARG that you could probably think about nowadays is one that you would use your phone with like a Pokemon Go or Google's Ingress, which are both uh, related to Keyhole and the CIA, the NRO and how – they are basically utilizing people's phones to geospatially map the entire planet. And, you know, like this is something that has been happening. You know, I grew up in Casa Grande. There's this Project Corona, and it was like the first time that the NRO ever started trying to map the planet. It started, you know, like right where I grew up, and I thought that was very, very strange. But, you know, like these ARGs are generally games that people play to, you know, like have fun to win something. And I think within the Cicada 3301, ARG, different individuals that had one had gotten, you know, like something of monetary value to, you know, have, sell, whatever. And, you know, from this year, I do believe somebody found some like gold coins, you know, like I found the spear. And then I've also gotten, you know, like a bunch of different letters and things that, you know, like were mine to keep. And I believe in the previous years, there's been other things that people have uh, found. But I believe that this year has just been different because I'm the only person that's ever, you know, like, spent all the time to show everybody what's actually going on because for a majority of people if you didn't know what it was all about it was basically like you were staring at a wall and you had no rope right right yeah i mean you don't even know what what it's all about uh, is there some concern then there there was something with i guess cicada or tangri that you thought you're helping was it almost an alien in tangri where you thought you might be helping or the idea was that you're helping some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence or that you're helping um change the world for the better for example is that that's one of the ideas they throw in there right to encourage yeah. people to play the game of course of course yeah i think that's how it was with the tangri rg too is like with tangri it was very interesting you know they were saying that they're aliens and stuff but i was went ahead and played along with their stuff but i would very facetiously would say you know like oh yeah they're totally aliens that's what they say and you know it's kind of it, it kind of is what it is i mean throughout my endeavors i do actually have a picture and i've been able to ascertain that one of the individuals is you know indeed a person because he sent me a picture of his hands with his wedding ring on it and stuff and i've been like oh okay so you know like it's always been people you know i thought it was i always thought it was about four people i figured it would have taken four people to really do most of the stuff that they did and a lot of it seemed to be based out of a book actually there's like a really really little known book of mathematical problems and solutions and it seems that like most of the way that they did the puzzle actually came from this book so it's like they took this book and they made it into real life kind of like how they're doing that ready player one movie they had a book about it for a very long time and now there's actually going to be like a movie about it but it's supposed to really get into kind of how these ARGs operate and how you're supposed to move through them. You know, like I just the way that I did it this year and, you know, kind of put everything out there for everybody, I really kind of changed the way that, it, you know, people understood it because most folks thought that there was a, a lot more going on than there really was. Okay, cool. Okay, well, I, I, uh, I wanted to talk to you about ARGs because I'm interested and that's one thing you specialize in. But we are talking here, I don't know if you knew that, Defanger, we're talking about what we think 
for this world and maybe for us as YouTube producers, what the biggest problems are, what um, those solutions might be. I haven't gone to you, Steve, yet, have I? Uh, no. Uh, do, do you want me to talk about ARGs or do you want me to tell you the, the No, no, topic? we're going to move on from ARG since it's not the topic of the show. I was just interested in it. No, tell me what you think um, problem. Uh, it's something that you think is a big deal that we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I think is one of the biggest problems, which is fake news. And the reason that fake news is a problem is that we're going to be given, you know, Google and Facebook as the solution to this fake news. And, you know, how do Google and Facebook decide what's fake news or not? Well, they go to Snopes. And, you know, the, the whole world is going to be driven by Snopes. Did we land on the moon in 1969? Snopes. So I, I don't think that we can rely on the system to fix this fake news problem for us because the system is designed to feed us propaganda, you know, keep them in the dark and feed them bullshit. And, uh, you know, for, for us as a people to move forward, that, you know, the Internet's such an incredible tool for knowledge. And we've been blessed that we could get this knowledge and we can make things up for ourselves. And this is why these YouTube truth channels are so important because this is an opportunity not just to share the knowledge with people, but to actually help them understand how to think for themselves and how to process this information. So, you know, I think that there's, a, there's an answer in how we deal with fake news and I don't want to get too caught up in the blockchain again, but the blockchain is not just about cryptocurrency. It is about having you know, a record that everybody can rely on because it's shared. So you know, I, I have an idea that I call on the record. And basically, you could get any topic or any concept and you could put it on the record. So people who make a claim and they want to be known in history as they were the first one to ever make that claim. There they go. That's that's on the record. But it would sort of become like Wikipedia. So there would be an area of a fact and then people could go on the record and they could put all the evidence for either side of the argument around that fact. So you might say something like, you know, Pizzagate and all the people who say, well, you know, Pizzagate, that's a conspiracy theory. They could come on the record and they could add all of their evidence that, you know, from their side shows it's a conspiracy theory. And those of us who think that it's very much real would come and we could put all of our evidence so that people could see for themselves for any particular topic. Well, what is the actual evidence? And it's surprising to me that this a system like this hasn't really emerged on the Internet. I think Wikipedia was sort of trying to be that, but it's been kind of overtaken by the Silicon Valley social justice warrior uh, mindset and, and also the deep state. And so I don't find Wikipedia such a reliable source anymore. But you know, the Internet is great at disseminating information and recording it everywhere, but we're relying on search engines to be able to process it and we don't know their, their algorithms. So yeah, that's, that's my idea to fight fake news is to have a repository of information where on any topic you can see all the evidence and arguments either way. Is there a way to do that? that is there a way to compete against Wikipedia at this point? Or does, does the blockchain give you some kind of uh, new solution for that? Or well, blo blockchain technology gives you the way to record something where it can't be tampered with. Like, for example, uh, you know, I, I use the Wayback Machine at archive.org all the time in my research. And if I find something that's particularly juicy information about, say, the deep state, and it's been deleted from the web, but it still exists in the Wayback Machine, you know, that gives me a lot of reassurance that that information is true because there's no reason to bother the lady from the internet if it's just a load of crap, right? So the stuff that gets pulled off the internet is arguably even more valuable than the, the stuff that, that is on there. Um, so, but the Wayback Machine, even then, you can't trust it. And, you know, I believe there's some information that's even been pulled from the Wayback Machine. Uh, so the blockchain technology offers a way that things can be recorded permanently. And you, you, it doesn't have to be an existing blockchain. You can create a, a private blockchain specifically for this purpose. But you know, we were talking before about Steemit and how when you publish to Steemit, you can go back to your post to edit it, which is quite a useful function. As an author, I like to be able to do that. But in terms of recording facts... It's only seven days, though. You can't edit them after seven days. Is that how it works? Okay, yeah, because I didn't know you could edit it at all. At least with DTube, you can't way to change yeah. anything on it. It was just like whatever mistakes or whatever misspellings, and it's out there. Um, that's a that's an 
well, one of the things and, and what that relates to is, you know, 1984 and what we're seeing these days in terms of how we're creating that 1984 reality is the whole idea of a memory hole and changing history. And yeah. what you're talking about, Steve, is exactly the defense against being able to erase history or remake it in the way that you want it to. And I'm I'm with you. I think they have they scrub stuff off of um, they scrub stuff off of the archive too. And I I even went to a website that said this website does not archive ever. I guess ever. And I I'd never seen that before. Um, and I found that to be really suspicious. Um, well, that's an interesting problem, an interesting solution. I don't know that I have anything to add as far as what we can do to fix it. I think Steemit and the blockchain, like we talked about, are possible sources for doing that and having a decentralized thing where stuff does stay on the record. Um, Defango, let's ask you, what do you uh, think? Uh, well, go ahead. If you want to talk about this or you can talk about what you think a problem is that needs to be solved and maybe uh, propose some kind of solution for it. To add on to what he was saying, um, I think you guys are actually on the right point because that's what I was looking at myself. Like I've been spending a lot less time, you know, just streaming all the time, but that's just because I'm researching stuff like building things for the future. Like I was working on the vote chain and the vote chain's pretty much almost completed, but uh, I was thinking about uh, doing something like a Wikipedia type blockchain, like the wiki chain, I guess that would be the easiest thing to call it. And uh, I would actually was looking at utilizing something like Steemit, except for changing the rules around because you can do that with Steemit. But with before with Steemit, you only had a day to uh, you know get rewards for your articles, but it led to a lot of spamming, and then a lot of people weren't getting good articles. So later on, they changed it to a seven day swing. And uh, what I always thought is that uh, it would be really really powerful to take Steemit. And then just kind of like adopt the block or adopt the Wikipedia format on top of it. There's already somebody on Steemit that was working on something, at least talking about it. And I believe that you know doing that would probably actually help us out a long time. But we would actually almost almost honestly have to fork the actual uh, blockchain over to so like create our own private chain and just make it so that you know the information is always editable. Although it would be really interesting to see, you know, like which topics had the most ownership because uh, technically, you know, like if you were posting on something like that, you know, whoever posted it the first time when, you know, would own the content or whatever, then, you know, everybody that edited, ap edited, edits it after it would have to do something, you know, very interesting. So like to me, that's like one of the best ways to really solve that problem because these are the big issues of today that's why I originally when i proposed that we do ohm coin like i wanted to have a function where that was possible and currently in the iteration where it has now it's not but i heard they might be forking the coin over to uh, do some of the things that we were talking about in the initial you know like launch of it so there there could be some interesting things that come out of that but you know i don't know i don't really know exactly what's going on with that situation as for me right now um you know the google blockchain or the google itself is you know in, in so much control of uh, what we see and do on the internet but i mean i feel like a lot of people don't realize that it's not all powerful i mean it can be manipulated and it's effectively being manipulated by individuals sometimes with no money or very little uh you know resources although when big companies you know ask for something to be done they can remove shit from wikipedia they can get shit removed from the Wayback Machine if they choose to pay the right amount of money. And I think that the biggest thing that we could do right now is to get more people uh, to have the awareness of what decentralization is and what the blockchain and what Bitcoin and all these other cryptocurrencies really are. I think education, in my opinion, has always been like the main thing. And, you know, as we teach more people about this type of stuff, I think it's going to be that paradigm shift that we're all looking for. You know, the paradigm shift that changes people's mindsets so they go from being, you know, money managers to having to worry about their rubles or rupees or dollars every single day to having to worry about, oh, wait a minute, my money's just making money for me because, you know, it's a shift. You know, like I made the shift and now I just look at my crypto and go, oh, God, well, what do I do now? I don't have to do shit. 
why are you even still it's sort of like i think about david seaman i'm like well, what the hell is he st why do i still have to watch him on youtube he should be he should be a billionaire he's been talking about bitcoin and ethereum so long yeah it's great it's it's great yeah i i feel i got in late um but even what i've seen it's never too late know, it's never too it, it we're not even we're barely at the beginning right now i think um so you know i i advise what you guys probably do too i just invited somebody else um there are a few people in the chat um james munder and frank bacon frank bacon is one of the people i follow on steam it i don't have his thing to i met send that guy in person did you yeah he might yeah. be um he might be joining us if i figure out how to send him a link um so we have a few people in the chat we're 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 similar minded certainly on we're all on the steam at blockchain solution kind of thing um why don't you talk um defango because i'm interested you um pal around with some people who are um trump supporters um you know pretty adamant i think and um here i told hold on i'm i'm sorry i'm having to do two things at once i sent you a link to the hangout on twitter uh at james frank's and, on a twitter and i'll send now i'll send one to you um if you have somewhere i can okay all right um what do you think about well, what do you think about the right left divide? That's what we were talking about. And where do you did you work for Obama, by the way? Or you worked for the free I Obama did. campaign, right? Okay. I did. I, did. What, I, I volunteered, though. It's, I was the volunteer. So, like, I volunteered because my you time supported for the Obama. campaign into, for President Obama in 2008 and uh, New Mexico. Because I, think I was there for six months. Yeah. It, and you were on because you support you volunteered because you supported Obama, which I'm I can say I voted for him three times, you know, in primary yeah. and both elections. So um That's not why I went. <laughs> no? Why did you volunteer then? Actually I volunteered for the McCain campaign and the Obama campaign. So like uh I went for both of them, like I applied for both of them. And the only reason I went to the Obama campaign was because they called me in about fifteen minutes after I or I had, I had applied and you know basically told me that like oh yeah we'll pretty much set you up give you a place to stay pay your way you know you're not going to make any money but you know you, you could just do your thing and i was like oh that's great so you know i just kind of went showed up and was a volunteer you know like i wasn't really like in charge of anything i ended up being in charge of like it because nobody else knew what the hell they were doing in those areas and i got to go around a couple places but i mean it, I didn't really have any political affiliation. I wasn't registered as a Democrat, and I didn't even vote in that election. I'll be perfectly honest. I didn't even vote for Obama or for the other so, guy. I was just there. I so, was just there to learn, really. Okay. All right. So I, I'll take your word for it. I, you know, I think a lot of people accuse you of being an operative or something, right? That's you get accused of being CIA. I accuse you of being a shill for somebody. I am. I, an, I, I, I am an operative. For myself, for right. my own intelligence agency. See, if you look right here, it's the first intelligence agency. Oh, there we go. First intelligence agency. So I started my own one. And if you notice, there's like, you know, the little WikiLeaks thing in the thing of it. I mean, everybody has their own little understandings of the world. I just kind of look at like the television show, Mr. Robot. And I realize is that, you know, you could be an operative for anybody unwittingly and you wouldn't know it. I'm pretty smart. I just keep to myself and I work for myself and over time, you know, like I've built up other people, but you know, we all have the same purpose and you all right. Right. Which, uh, like we're doing which is cool. I, I, I wanted, Oh man, sorry. I cut you off. Your audio went out and I thought you were done talking. I want to ask because of, uh, b because one thing, one of the reasons I, I talked to you and I, I liked what you did to RDS um, is that you're not like a, you're not a staunch Trump supporter. Um, how do you feel about Donald Trump? I think he's the Antichrist. And, uh, but that's like, I made videos about it in the past too. And I have tons of Trump supporter friends. And I'm like, you know, I really don't care about the presidency or right or left. Um, 
I, when I voted for him, you know, like it was a, it was an active thought in my mind that if the world was going to burn, you know, like this is going to be the funnest way, you know, as opposed to like, you know, the whole Clinton thing. So like I willingly went and did it so that, you know, people would hate on me and I get a lot of hate for it. But honestly, it's like, I don't really even like, I could give a shit about like the single political affiliations. I just want to see something happen. And it's very interesting to see that, you know, most of the stuff that Trump has said that he was going to try to get done he's working on you know like there's only a couple other little tiny things that he hasn't gotten through so i mean i can't really hate the guy but you know i still think he's the antichrist and he did just name jerusalem you know the head of israel so you know i don't know there's just a whole lot of biblical stuff going in there and i'll be honest i was always worried about that stuff when i was a kid and it still hides in the back of my mind and I'm just going to go ahead and stick with that you know like i feel like we're at the the precipice of something that's going to be really really ridiculous and then i think that both the people that are trump's you know staunch trump supporters are going to be vehemently surprised with what ha actually happens and i think at the same time the democrats and you know the hillary hill bots and all the other that that side of people you know the antifas and whatever all those people are really really gonna not like what happens either i mean i feel like somebody's been playing their own game and they're trying to get everybody to worry about this stuff that's up in front of us and there's something completely different going on on the backside that nobody's been talking about but you know like i don't like to talk you, about so, that shit too much <laughs> so but it sounds like you're convinced that there's some kind of paradigm shift coming and you want to describe how you think that plays out well i mean obviously like my paradigm shift has always thought that i wouldn't get on the computer and start you know talking and doing this stuff until a certain time and i gave myself to like i was 30 to start you know going and just sp speaking with people and i've got a lot of content on my channel that shows that you know like i've slowly but surely you know, like opened up more and more of my information to individuals and i feel like there is a big paradigm shift coming i felt it 10 years ago when i was sitting in front of a computer and reading things on the internet and i've seen that it has grown like wildfire some of the stuff that i use that i post every day on steam it you know my messages these this stuff was not you know getting hit by anybody and yet nowadays I feel like more and more people are becoming attuned to that like understanding. And I believe that there's a lot of people out there that are looking for information that watch channels like your channel, my channel, like everybody's channel. Ultimately, at the end of the day, everybody has their own feeling. Everybody just thirsts for the fire of knowledge, basically. And uh, I believe that that fire is, you know, being fed by us. But, you know, it does give us like kind of the ability to really like help people see you know both sides of the coin you know see the different aspects of relation because that's really like in order for us to be the greatest kind of people we need to be able to see past the division and see the unity and be able to like because once you once you live in a place of unity vision you can utilize it to your advantage every single time because you know that these people don't understand you know like the overall arcing aspect of what they're working on you know you got to be able to see three moves ahead of your opponent but you also have to be able to see, you know, the next five moves after that as well, you know, and it's all a mental thing, I believe. Every single person's moving, looking, trying to find some hope and purpose, and I just hope that everybody finds it in themselves first. And that's what I'm seeing with a bunch of people all around, you know. So many people looking for information, truth. It's great. I mean, it seems like every one of those woo-woo people that was out there 10 years ago that said... People were crazy. They were saying that this was going to happen, and then here we are. So what's the next step? I don't know. Some crazy shit in the sky? That would be cool. Probably not going to happen. <laughs> well, you know, I, th I think. Go ahead. The, I, th I think, Defago, you're you're a pretty positive guy, and Nathan, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but uh, you can come across as a little cynical at times, and uh, I think it's important for all of us to stay positive and think positive and try to be on that higher frequency vibration because i think the world is getting better and i think the world wants to get better and these technologies the internet the web you know live streaming on youtube cryptocurrency these are all signs of the evolution that you know we're going through to a, a better world like you say nathan you know we're building a new heaven and a new earth together so what do we want that to be what are the components of it well you know i think something that's based on truth and not propaganda, I think that's really, really important. And I think the point Titus made earlier as well, that you know our biggest problem is still child sex trafficking and the rule of this Luciferian pedo cult at the top of echelons of society. 
that's a problem too. So how do we get past it? Well, we evolve past it uh, to, to the light because these are things of darkness and the creatures of darkness can't exist if they're exposed to the light. Mm-hmm. You're Good. exactly right. Well, you know what? I think since um, I had a few people in mind, but I think that's the right message really to end on. And we've, we've done a nice um, two hour show that people can consume after the fact. I, I think uh, I was thinking of the law of one, the law of love, universal love. And, and that's what I try to do. I invited all kinds of people on this show, including you, Defango, who we've definitely had some issues before. Um, but I'm trying um, my best to do my part in, in that by bringing people together to talk about stuff like this. And I think uh, we're going a long way. I think all three of us, um, you know, like we have to change ourselves first. And that's something I've been working on uh, diligently. Um, and changing a lot. Um, and that's how the world changes. And every every person that we reach out to has to do that for themselves too. Mm-hmm. So did you guys have any any closing last words? I know you weren't I on do. too long. But yeah. I do. Yeah, um, I wanted to share something with you, Nate, that I've talked about it on my show. It's kind of when the Tangri stuff started to happen. Um, I was uh, working on, you know, like Buddhism, but I had met a really, really high spiritual guy. And it was really funny. He gave me his book. Uh, he never talked to me. He did some weird thing until he looked at my necklace and realized that I didn't need to do, have the thing done that he was trying to do. He just gave me a book, but he always told me that I wouldn't figure out what the book would have meant until much later. And I've been like always going back to it. But it's like Buddhism and Taoism, and it, he's this guy is so smart. He just connects everything. But he always shared something with me, and it's like our first empowerment. And I wanted to share it with you because, like, I think that if which you just said really just reminded me of it. And the first empowerment is very simple. It's like, I goes like this. It says, I have the power to create soul healing miracles for myself and everyone around me. You have the power to create soul healing miracles together for yourself and everyone around you. Together, we can create soul healing miracles for everyone and countless stars, galaxies, planets, and universes. You know, like that's an empowerment. And that's something that I like to share people because, you know, you have to be able to repeat that to yourself. Number one, you have to repeat it to your friend. And it's all based in love, like love yourself, love your neighbor, love your world. And I think that that's going to be that's like the first step for anybody out there that just trying to like find unity, you know, regardless of what happens between people. I mean, with me, that's always number one. Number one. All right. Great. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, I think I think we I think we covered what we needed to cover for today. I'd like to do this every Thursday. There were, like I said, Frank uh, Bacon, James Munder were both in the chat. Um, I'd love it if they could join me uh, next week. I had a little bit of a connection problem this time. Maybe it'll be better next time. But I just think it was great. I really think it was great having both of you guys on and and uh, Titus earlier and Ryan earlier. For, um, and I'll have to make sure to put links. To everybody's channel. Do you want me to put anything in for you, Steve? Yeah, you can. I'm at, at Steve Outram on Twitter, uh, and I've got a YouTube channel, Steve Outram, as well. You can find some of my videos there. Okay, cool. Okay, at Steve Outram on Twitter. Okay, I'll put that in the and we'll and Defango. You guys can find his channel too, and I'll and then we also had on the Last American Vagabond that you can find on that channel just by searching those words. And I'll, I'll put a link in, in his, to his channel in the description. And you can also find <laughs> Titus Frost, uh, who's Dean Fugger. Oh, Free Doshi. I'll tell you more about T-shirts. Free Doshi. We're going to make some nice, we're going to make some more Doshi gear. We have some stickers coming. You'll have to order some, um, it, uh, Defango. Since since you created the original Where's Doshi or, or uh, Free Doshi t shirt He's got his Actually, it was one of my TV, subscribers, though. but yeah, no, I still have it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to, we're going to be doing a lot of that anyway, enough of the endings guys. Um, we're going to try to do this every Thursday at 1 11 PM. Um, I think, I think I, I'll commit to that in the spirit of bringing love and unity. All right. That's what it is. Everybody. <laughs>